Despite a crowded field of candidates, more than 50% of those voting for Hawaii Island Mayor supported Harry Kim, sending him back to the highest elected office in the county. And Leeward Coast District 44 will get a new state house representative. We have both candidates ready to take your questions. The Democrat, Cedric Gates, who upset the incumbent, Joe Jordan, and his Republican opponent in the general election, Marcus Pa'aluhi. Get your questions ready for all three guests. This live broadcast of Insights on PBS Hawaii starts now. Aloha, welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now. During the recent primary election, former two-term Hawaii Island Mayor Harry Kim beat out 12 other contenders by a majority vote. He'll now prepare for a third term as mayor, a title he hasn't held since 2008. In the second half of the show, we'll feature Democrat Cedric Gates and Republican Mark Pa'aluhi, who will battle it out for the House seat representing Miley, Waianae, Makaha, and Makua. It's an open seat since Gates beat incumbent Joe Jordan in the primary election. We hope you'll participate in tonight's discussion. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org. Don't forget to call in your questions early for Mayor-elect Kim, because he will only be with us for the first half of the show. Now to our first guest, Mayor-elect Harry Kim won the primary election with just a little more than 50% of the vote, which secured his spot as Hawaii County's next mayor. This will be Mr. Kim's third term as mayor. He served two terms from 2000, from the year 2000 to 2008. Mr. Kim also worked in Hawaii County's civil defense system for 24 years. Before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at the demographic makeup of Hawaii Island. Hawaii Island is most often referred to as the Big Island. It actually represents more than 62% of the land mass for the entire state. And that is the highest of any county in the country. The population is 196,428, and there are 64,382 households. 29.2% of all Hawaii Island residents say they are two races or more. 34.5% are Caucasian, 22.6% Asian, and 12.4% are Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. Government is the county's largest employer. More than 8,000 Hawaii County residents are employed by the state. The county government employs 2,745 residents, and 1,364 people are federal employees. Other major employers are large resorts, such as Hilton Waikoloa, and retail outlets such as Walmart and KTA stores. Hawaii County residents pay some of the highest utility rates in the country. The entire state has been dependent on fossil fuels to generate electricity. Today, 37% of the electricity generated on Hawaii Island is coming from renewable resources such as geothermal, wind, hydro, biomass, and solar. The goal is to get to 92% of electricity generated from a mix of renewable energy by the year 2030. Mayor Kim, welcome to Insights. Oh, thank you. Good seeing you again. You too. And, uh, you know, at 76, you could have chosen to have a comfortable retirement, yet now you're committed to at least four more years of very hard work. What was it that brought you to, to do this, to commit to running for office and commit to being mayor again? First of all, it wasn't easy. It wasn't a decision you make uh, at this time of my life that you kind of were looking forward to a different lifestyle. Uh, it literally took months of uh, discussion with family. Uh, one thing we, we knew, the decision had to be something that we all embraced. And uh, in truth, uh, the reason of running is because of the atmosphere on Hawaii Island what, in regards to relationship with the government. Uh, th this is something I pushed for uh, way back when. I always felt that government, true government, should be an extension of the people. And this is why we pushed for and got passed what we call by ordinance, the Community Development Plan concept. And the whole basis of that is so people would be more involved in their lifestyle and the future of their home, uh, what will be developed or not developed and where. Uh, that's how important it was to be. And I felt that the uh, president administration did not embrace that. It was clear they didn't embrace it uh, in regards to what they did or didn't do. And that among other things that I think we all know about uh, the trust towards our government uh, became you know, even worse. 
You know, you um, were somewhat instrumental in uh, Mayor Kutnoy's rise on the Big Island, and he worked for you. And uh, and th was there a sense that uh, the scandal that surrounded his administration toward the end was something that you needed to come back and set right? I didn't look at it that way because of the scandal. You know, uh, that would take care of itself, and I'll trust the uh, legal system to handle that part. My responsibility regards to the consequence of what was happening, uh, people and their government. I, I state again the very importance from way back of the relationship with their people and the government is that important to me. And I felt that relationship uh, is getting bigger and as far as the gap getting bigger. bigger. But it's not just Hawaii County, it's from the federal state you know, uh, and the county level that is occurring. Are you talking about the attitude of the current political class that you feel is, is, is inappropriate or wrong? I, in short, I'm talking about the whole political element. Uh, let's take a look at what's happening on the federal level. I don't think I have to elaborate on that. Especially being a Hawaii Island, you know the detachment between the people here and the federal government. Uh, let's take the state of Hawaii. You know, we have four counties, and one of them is obviously the main island of Oahu, where you have 70 plus percentage of the, uh, the state population. We are separated by waters. We are separated in regards to a tremendous limited way of uh, going from one island to the other, and mainly cost factor, and much less just one means of transportation, one airline. Now, all of that contributes to a detachment in regards to people and their government. Uh, I'd be a task to define which is the most important, but I do know this. Uh, take a look at our last voting record for the state. If we are not concerned of what is happening, of people not feeling to be part of their government, I don't know what will be. I mean, take a look at uh, the statements made. The lowest voter turnout in probably, uh, you know, in the history of the state of Hawaii. I mean, we all have to be very concerned about that and start asking the questions why. You know, uh, the victory that you scored um, on primary night was in excess of what anybody thought was reasonable to expect. Twelve other candidates, one of them quite a strong candidate, um, two of them probably pretty strong candidates. Um, and you said that since that victory, you've had a lot of feedback from people. Tell me what that feedback has been like and what it makes you feel like as a returning mayor. First of all, the feedback has been nothing less than just uh, amazing in regards to people. I don't think I can ever explain to you what it feels like to be on the receiving end of the kind of comments I've been receiving. Uh, if I were to say of excitement, if I were to say of you know, even joy in regards to over change. This is not to put down the present administration. I'm just saying this is what I've been receiving in regards to people uh, wanting to have a difference in regards to their government and themselves. And you know, they, they start to talk about things that uh, I think are uh, very important to them that has been different. And there is one word, and I've used it, and, I, and others have, and that is the, the relationship of trust. And I think that has dissipated. Do you think people have a sense of hope that they didn't have before? I truly hope so, using that uh, word in regards to that question. I truly hope so. OK, so let's move on to some viewer questions starting to come in already. Um, and this kind of deals with what you're talking about, the separation of people. On the big island, you're so big, you, sometimes there's separation between one side and the other side of the island. And that's what this question about is that West Hawaii has long held the belief that what we pay it most of the taxes but don't receive much in return. Uh, it mentions that you, a feeling among some people that West Hawaii is not your part of the island. Um, how do you unite these two very diverse sections of the island and do you have to make overtures to West Hawaii to, uh, to bring about that kind of unity you're hoping for? I don't think I have to make overtures because I think the biggest problem with my administration, the eight years we, you know, in office, is the lack of uh, communication of my part, and that's basically all my fault. You know, I didn't think it was important, and until recently, during this campaign, uh, would you believe that eight years as mayor, I never held one press conference of what we were doing and because achieving. Uh, you know, my cabinet members just, just literally scold me and say, you have to, you know, let people know what you're doing. 
And I, I said it then, and, and I still feel struggling about it. You know, our job is to do the job, you know. They know what we're doing, mm -hmm. and but I find that to be my mistake. And what I have to do better, and I will do better. And matter of fact, I just uh, called the editor of the Westway newspaper, and I said, I'd like to have a meeting with you to uh, you know, talk to you about that so I can learn from you how to be better in communication. Because truthfully, in regards to the comments of uh, not servicing Westway, uh, the problem was not of that, because I'm very proud of uh, what was done, not satisfied, very proud of what was done in the eight years. Mm -hmm. And because a number of projects made, our problem was, my problem was not communicating what was done. Let me ask um, also now, we, we, you talked a little bit about how um, people were very concerned about what happened with the prior administration and the lack of trust. Um, other than being a, a, a good example, do you see what kind of, actual reforms or changes in laws do you think might be necessary to help restore that public trust, uh, more checks and balances, a more active ethics commission or a stronger ethics law? What, what do you think needs to be done in that respect? That's gonna be something that we all have to address in regards to all the different things that we need to do. First of all, I think it's common knowledge of the uh, disappointment in regards to action of the ethics board. Uh, I do know one thing on the P card, you know, constant question on what are you gonna do in regards to change of the rules of P card. My answer from the beginning uh, has been the same till now. The rules are good, the rules are adequate. You know, it was a, a strictly uh, person uh, that are uh, uh, allegations of misuse of that. But we have to be fair in that to the others. Uh, I think the investigation showed no misuse of the P card by other people. If you go back, well, because we initiated, we mean in my administration, uh, the P card usage for the convenience of people and especially during emergencies. So on that point though then, um, do you feel like it's very important that uh, Mayor Kinoy face some pretty severe consequences for, for what he's done? Assuming that he gets convicted, we don't know that. He's, he's been charged but has not gone to trial yet. Do you think that it's important that there be consequence for for misuse if you're not wanting to put more rules into its use? Oh, it has to be. Now, whether it be P card or anything, you know, I think uh, uh, especially of uh, government trust. Uh, for the most part, people don't ask much of government except to do your job. And it has to be that uh, of that trust that we will do the job according to laws. Uh, you know, I didn't make up the, the slogan of what I stood for from the very beginning, that we will follow the laws. And if I violate it, absolutely there have to be consequences to my violations. Would you expect to go to jail? If I, it warranted. Okay, um, moving on again to more of your questions. One of the first coming in is one of the more controversial, so we'll go for it. As mayor, how do you see your role in the TMT issues on the Big Island? I know that you have stated you support the TMT uh, project. Uh, what's the role of, of yourself as mayor? And two, um, what do you think is the consequence to the county if it doesn't get built? Well, the consequence, I think, is yes, the county is directly heavily but I think the consequences in regards to science of the uh, talking to people who are of international in regards to that uh, project. I'm not an astronomer by any measure, but I do know this from talking to them. I think we all do. Uh, you're not as old as I am, but you know we grew up and I, <laughs> I think you know we thought the universe, you know, these many planets, and et cetera, et cetera. And I was just talking to Ms. Dr. Ihe from Japan, who is one of the board members of that uh, project. And he just received a national award in Japan. And that award was that he discovered a system 18 billion light years away. And I said, billion as a boy. And I, I told him, that is so far beyond what I can even imagine what, how far that is. And this is the excitement of what the scope will bring. And it's, a, it's opening up a window, and I wrote it in response to a media question, that you know, uh, it's an excitement like, I think, discovering the, the wheel. Let yeah, me yeah. ask though, just to, to be a little bit more direct about it, is, um, you know, it's a 
conundrum for po politicians so far. The governor has really struggled with it. Um, local politicians have really struggled with this. As a person that's been on the Big Island all this time, what do you think is the solution, the political solution to getting it built? When I said I supported uh, TMT, to cut out what I said at the end, and the continuation of TMT uh, is supported, but only if we do it right. I will be having some meetings in regards to you know different uh, people of different uh, sides of this, and one thing I, I need to take advantage of this is that you know we we means all people of authority and responsibility uh, have to understand why is there are so much dissatisfaction of that mountain. That mountain is only symbolic of our disregard, our disrespect, you know, of the culture of Hawaii, but not just, just culture of Hawaii, of the people, you know, past and present. I gave them the example of what happened in Maui in the 80s, and in regards to the unearthing of a mass Hawaiian uh, grave, you know, the building of a resort. And I was questioning this just yesterday, okay, because of the people who want to get involved already want me to get involved. And I asked them this question, tell me about the burial council. And there was absolutely no knowledge of it. The burial council is a perfect example of our disregard, disrespect of culture, of people of all. And until we, we meaning collectively, anyone who has any responsibility in regards to the development of monarchy, unless we so search, I, I said this in the 80s. Mm -hmm. You people of science, I said this to the university, people of science, and I've said it to others since then. You look at Mauna Kea as pristine for science. In your use of Mauna Kea, please understand there are people that look at Mauna Kea as part of their soul. Do you think um, it's important then to give Native Hawaiians a much more significant role in um, taking care of the mountain? or being the managers of the mountain, because that's been suggested. Uh, do you think that might be a key part of a compromise? I don't know if it's a key part. I think the key part is a recognition of where we went wrong. And I don't mean of Mauna Kea, just the development of this place. Uh, this place includes uh, Oahu. And, uh, we have better, uh, have, uh, better you know, foresight in regards to what we're doing to the lifestyle of here. Uh, Mauna Kea to me is just symbolic of the uh, decades of misuse, of abuse, of disrespect and disregard of people, you know, of their heritage and their beliefs and their care and their love. And we look at things as uh, for science, we look at things for money or development. And yes, to put, have uh, the Hawaiians participate, obviously, is a very good thing. Uh, but that in itself is not the end result of where, where we should go. Where we should go is for all of us involved to take a good look. I was asked to go to Maui you know, several years ago, and I, they asked me to write something you know, about what I thought of Maui. And I wrote, you know, it was in a paper. I said, you know, if we don't stop what we're doing, the way we're doing it, we're going to look back shortly and say, what have we done? All of us are now uh, faced with the homeless problem. Yeah, let me uh, jump to a question about that. Uh, you know, how bad is homelessness on the Big Island? We've always heard there's so much space. They're kind of more dispersed than they are in other islands. But what do you think uh, is, is, the, is the role of the mayor in, in dealing with that? And how high a priority is that for you as, uh, as you come in as mayor? It's extremely important, not only for Hawaii County, but for the state of Hawaii from every level, including community. The fact that we have more spaces for people to hide in and not be seen is not an issue here. I think if you look and analyze some of the numbers game, one of the most frightening thing about uh, the numbers for Hawaii Island is that the number of people of homeless, as Dr. Kopp, who has been trying so hard to bring attention and focus on what is happening, that the number of the homeless in Hawaii Island of women and children and what happens to them. And then you'll see the inconsequence of how big the numbers are. And by percentage, I'm sure it's the same. Uh, the numbers that have been growing tremendously in the past few years, few years meaning within the last decade, is frightening. And I've said this to uh, the last forum. 
this is not the government problem, and you know, it's not for us to fix. It is for all of us to be aware of what's happening, and all, you know the the developers have to be involved. Everyone has to be involved, or you and I. It will not be long before we're going to take a look and say, what have we done? Is your thought about homelessness that it's primarily on the Big Island now? Every every island has a different kind of homeless problem. Is it primarily economic homelessness on the Big Island, or is it primarily uh, the drug addiction that's driving people out? Or do you have a sense of what's the biggest driver of homelessness on your island? Regardless of which island, I think the basic cause is very simple. We have developed a lifestyle of the economy and price of living here that uh, the average person in regards to the average income you know, is either at, at risk of becoming homeless or are homeless or are afraid of becoming homeless because of everyone knows about the family with one job, so one and a half or two jobs. Everyone knows of the struggle of the married people with young children of tomorrow. Everyone knows about the uh, disappearance of the American dream of owning a place. Uh, the islands problem of Hawaii is no different than Oahu, Maui, and Kauai. We're just lucky enough that our population is not that big. But still, the problem is the same immensity. You know, um, we did get a call here from someone asking, what are your plans to address the substance abuse problem? And I. Um, I'm aware that there's one doctor in particular in, on the Hilo side who's quite a crusader on the prescription drug issue over there. Um, where, when it comes to substance abuse, what are the problems on your island? I mean, we know about marijuana, but what do you think are the biggest substance abuse problems, and do you see the county having a role there too? The county has to have a role in anything dealing with people on the island. It's not whether it be a state problem or like I'm very involved in a health issue there. You know, basically that's on authority and funding is state, but the people are the same. Uh, they, they don't care who funds it or who's the authority behind it. You know, those of leadership, are you given that responsibility, you better be involved. It involves your people, not who by legal responsibility is responsible for the administration of it. In regards to the drug problem, you know, when I first took office um, in 2000, I'll never forget the phone call. Uh, and I'll give his name. His name was Kit Rourke. He was an old friend who used to be a prosecutor. He said, Harry, do me a favor. So many of my clients are being affected by this thing called ICE and in regards to ruining family and violence and all that. And I called a meeting in regards to the people who should know to brief me on it, including the DEA, including the judicial system that uh, handles that at the end of the road. And being ignorant on the subject, except for what you hear, you become very concerned and even scared of it. And we de very selectively declared uh, what we're going to declare as a crisis. And ICE was the first thing that we declared a crisis. So regardless of how small a population or how big we are, the concentration of drugs is the social problems that we all have to know. Likewise, because it is uh, a social problem, the causes for it, you know, and how you address it is a totality thing. Are there resources? Uh, at the Big Island, we hear often about the lack of access to care, and we've got two questions along those lines. You know, one person asking, what do we have to do to get a cardiac care unit on our, on our island? Another one, would you support privatization of the hospitals on Hawaii Island? Um, that's uh, stumbling to a conclusion on Maui. But do, do you see that these are things that would be important to this kind of this healthcare access issue that you're talking about? Well, you should come up with good questions so the public There's does. There's viewers oh, doing yeah. this, viewers doing and, this. And I've been involved in that for a long time, you know. I think people on the Big Island know that. Uh, we call the healthcare summit meeting, get involved in regards to residency program, in regards to your direct questions on privatization. And the word they're using today is partnership. I'm trying to uh, come across the point to people uh, what you support or don't support. Please know the whole picture. There's no partnership here. This is private ownership. Uh, they will have full authority of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And the state is saying, here, here's the package. And it becomes a private sector. They give you a building and they tell you run yeah, a hospital. Right. Yeah. And I'm against it. 
I really am against it in regards for many different reasons, but a main reason for the island of Hawaii. Remember, we have no private hospitals except for a small one in North Hawaii community hospital. We are a rural community, a plantation background, and all of our hospitals were initially plantation, and then the county and then the state uh, as far as finances. You also have a tremendous number of people who are on government health care. Oh, yeah. So in a way, you're basically giving government money to people who are then going to go give it to a private organization um, as opposed to, are you saying though that you feel that the government support, the amount of state taxpayer money that is devoted to health care on your island is insufficient? Oh, totally insufficient, but it, it, remember the commitment. Oh, the state made a commitment that all citizens of this state deserves and should have adequate health care regardless of ability to pay. They also in a passage of bill stated in doing and saying that they have a responsibility financially to always be a part of that. And now we are trying to back off from that commitment. And I'm, uh, uh, my role is very simple, my position. Uh, you know, we, we need to take a good look at the needs of the people of the island of Hawaii as well as elsewhere. You know, I'm way beyond the point of simplicity you know, in regards to privatization means better health care, privatization means a more professional or a cost factor. I'm asking people to take a good look at hospitals by the private sector is a private business. If they do not show a, a net gain in their expenses, programs will be dropped. Whenever you have government-funded things, their priority is not the element of making profit. Their priority is of service, just like running the police department, the educational system. You know, my position has been hospital care, health care, is part of that responsibility. Okay, I'm going to move on now to energy, a question from the, a viewer. What is your position on the geothermal issue? And I'd like to add, put that in a larger context with the, the, the failure of the next Terra deal. A lot of people are talking about basically county-based, uh, either a co-op or local control of the utility. Where, where are you on that issue? When the next Terra issue came out, I was asked that. And, you know, my position at that time, and I was very glad that you know, it did not go through, was this. We're on the island of Hawaii. The home base of Nextera is in Florida. I care not to have one of the most essential elements of any society, the power, to be controlled by a huge corporation uh, thousands of miles away. Let me uh, go a little deeper on that question, though. Is um, Also, the thing about Hawaii Island is when there's a big disaster, and they tend to hit you first, the hurricanes, mm. the earthquakes, volcanoes. Uh, because we're better prepared. Because you're better prepared, because <laughs> you're ready, right. But um, if you had complete local control and a local financial base for your own utility, would you be stretched thin as opposed to having Hawaiian Electric there to come and help you out when there's a major destruction of the power infrastructure from a disaster. Do you favor local control of the utility even under those kind of circumstances? But, yeah, but I did not say local Hawaii Island control. You know. mm -hmm. Right now, I think there's a very good working relationship in regards to the three uh, power companies. Matter of fact, uh, we had a meeting this morning in regards to discussion because I had made position known in regards to when the PUC were uh, looking at the, uh, the plan. And I had stated in writing at the time uh, several years ago, I think two years ago, three years ago, in regards to where we should go. I think we're in a threshold right now in regards to technology, uh, needs, and everything else uh, to really stop here and take a good look at what the power needs are, all the technology in regards to uh, of production, distribution and before we start to really go in a set direction. For example, let's take uh, something you mentioned on geothermal. It is an image thing that oh, Harry's against geothermal because when he was civil defense, he rejected the emergency plan. Mm -hmm. My position on geothermal then and my position on geothermal now is the same. The state government on what we refer to Act 296, uh, 
made a commitment that geothermal would be developed with all of these conditions in regards to protection of the environment, protection of people, mm -hmm. you know, in regards to making sure a monitoring system to protect of land and people of safety. We broke that promise. And it is because of that I stood pat in saying, no, I will not approve this plan. You made a promise, the government made a promise to the people of Hawaii Island that you will develop geothermal this way to make sure that they are protected. We violated that. Don't make the, not you, but don't make the people who are complaining about it the bad people. Mm -hmm. It is of government. You know that violated that trust. Let them down. Okay, we got about two minutes more. It's been really quick, so let me go quickly through some of these these, these questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Tom, a master gardener in the Big Island, asks, "What's your plan to deal with the fire ant issue?" You know, we have so many failures as far as government. I'm not picking on any government, all of us, and including yours truly, obviously. The fire ant is an invasive species, a invasive species. We dropped the ball years ago in regards to our focus, meaning our mean those of authority, the focus of invasive species. Especially on the big island. Yeah, especially where they be cokey frogs, there'll be abyssal trees, there will be anything else. You and I both know, you know, we go to the mainland, my goodness, so what we can or cannot take. Well, you know as well as I do, uh, they can bring anything in with hardly any investigation inspection. Mm -hmm. As long as we continue that kind of nonsense to what I consider the most pristine and special place on God's earth, we will continue to have invasive species. And some of, God forbid, worse than fire ants, worse okay. than cokey frogs. Okay, another one here. I'm going to move real quick now. Uh, how will Mary Kim address homeowners who have vacation rentals that do not have the special use permits because they are an ag land? Is, is uh, vacation rentals a big issue for you? in terms of especially how it robs the uh, affordable housing. Uh. Well, it, it's a bigger issue in different places, but it is an issue. It's getting to be a bigger issue in regards to because we have basically no controls in regards to regulations. I think Kauai is the one county that really tried to take aggressive steps to say in regards to uh, uh, short-term uh, uh, rentals. So you need more controls of those vacations? Oh, well, we need to, really, because it's not just a matter of taxation. It's a matter of change in regards to uh, lifestyle of people in certain neighborhoods. Okay, good. I got one more question. Uh, favorite tax? I know that the uh, either gas tax or a higher excise tax is, is possible for the Big Island because of the, the way the laws are written. Do you, would you favor um, seeking more taxes uh, to, to get the infrastructure support you need? Raising of taxes has got to be everybody's last you know, choice in regards to how we raise revenue. The first thing is conservation in regards to without prudent and spending. In regards to excise tax, I think we all know excise tax is the worst tax as far as being a regressive tax. And I would never support the increase of uh, uh, excise tax. I mean, I would hope that we would take a look at how we can change our tax system. Uh, when you talk about homeless, even that is a big factor to me in regards to taking away from people who is counting every dollar. How can we raise the taxes when they, you know, they can't even pay their own bills? Okay, thank you. Mayor Kim, uh, it's thank been you. a pleasure as uh, always. Good seeing you again. You too, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Now we're about to move on to the candidates for State House District 44, but first let's take a look at a report by Hikino students about a controversy we talked a little bit about taking place on Hawaii Island. This was produced by the Kua Okala Milolii Hipu'u Virtual Academy. My name is Hoku Subiono, and I am a student at Kua Okala in Milolii. I love science and technology, and I'm actively involved in web design and computer technology. I'm also Hawaiian. I respect my culture and its values. In October, my classmates and I took these pictures at the groundbreaking ceremony of the 30-meter telescope. The 30-meter telescope at 34,000 square feet at 18 stories tall would be the largest telescope on Mauna Kea. Scientists say it will be 100 times better than any other telescope and will revolutionize astronomy. If you took all the telescopes on Earth right now, it's going to be better than all of them combined. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to believe, but it's, it's true. I was surprised at the protests how passionate my people were in opposition to the telescope. Many Hawaiians see it as further desecration and destruction of their cultural heritage as well as their natural resources. We have done many things together, but for this, I cannot stand and support you. 
You are about to try and make sacred the act that would desecrate our highest temple. We already know and we have seen how the UH maintains and takes care of this mountain. It does not. I wanted to know more, so I reached out to several different people about their thoughts on TMT. I asked Mayor Billy Kanoi, a native Hawaiian, about why he supports the project. I believe celestial navigation, astronomy, is a sacred science. I believe, as Hawaiians, uh, celestial navigation, uh, you know, we've, as part of our culture, you know, it is how we got here, it is how we return, it is how we come home. Um, also, Mauna Kea is a sacred place, it's a vahipana. I think it's entirely appropriate that a sacred science should occur in a sacred place. I asked Sandra Dawson, who works for the TMT, about the environmental impact studies concerning the project. We went way beyond what most people do when they do one. We had seven public meetings for our scoping. We went out into the community. We had seven more meetings when we did our draft EIS. Um, it's about a thousand pages and two volumes. And at the end, in 2010, when it was completed, the governor, Lingle at the time, signed it, approved it, and no one challenged it in court. I asked Kayla Hopiscotti, an environmental activist, about her position regarding the environmental impact of the TMT. The TMT's environmental impact statement, which is only a state level, by the way, it should be federal, um, has adopted the same positions that the federal one already came up with, and that is that 30 years of astronomy development on Mauna Kea has resulted in adverse and significant impact to the natural and cultural resources of Mauna Kea. What our position is on the mountain is that we want no further development. And those are just a few of the generous people who shared their opinions and arguments with me. Clearly this is a complicated issue. Without a simple solution, I'm still torn. I want to preserve the places that mean so much to my cultural heritage, but I also see that the project will bring new understanding of our universe and provide educational opportunities to students in Hawaii. I hope to revisit this in 10 years time and see for myself if TMT does in fact keep their commitments, both to help expand our knowledge of the universe and to be respectful stewards of our cultural sites. This is Hoku Subiono, reporting for Hikino. Now to the Democratic candidates for State House District 44, which includes Ma'ili, Waianae, Makaha, and Makua. Prior to tonight's show, there was a random drawing that determined the seating order and the order we will use throughout the program. Now to the candidates. At just 23 years old, Cedric Gates defeated incumbent Joe Jordan in the Democratic primary election for the House seat representing District 44. Mr. Gates is also a member of the Waianae Coast Neighborhood Board and former chairman and is on the board of directors for the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center. And Mark Paolo he won the recent Republican primary and will face Mr. Gates in the upcoming general election. Mr. Pa'aluhi also serves as the chair of the Waianae Coast Neighborhood Board and works as a construction superintendent and safety manager for GSI Pacific Construction. Before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at the Democrat demographic makeup of State House District 44. State House District 44 represents the 25,190 residents living in the communities of Wa'inai, Makaha, Makua, and Ma'ili. Compared to the state's median age, this is a young resident population with a median age of 32.7 years. The racial breakout alone or in combination is 35.3% Caucasian, 43.8% Asian, and 63.8% Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. The average household size is 3.5 persons. There are 5,296 families in the district, and the average household income is just under $56,000. 23.1% of all persons and 19.8% of all families live below the poverty level. 83% of all residents are high school graduates, and 11.1% have received a bachelor's degree. Just under 7% of the residents are foreign born, and 16.8% speak a language other than English. The median value of an owner-occupied housing unit is $312,400, and the median rental rate is $1,154. We'll start our questions with uh, Cedric Gates. You know, you beat an experienced incumbent in order to get into this race. What is it that voters are saying with, with that, that they feel like somehow experienced politicians aren't what we need, that we need newcomers? Yeah, that's what I received when walking the district and just being out in the community. Uh, the community believes we need a fresh new vision and it has been uh, 
uh, it has been actually voted by the community that I am that choice. And I am very pleased with the results and greatly appreciate the YNI community's support. Do you think that, it, 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 along with being positive for you in the Democratic primary, do you think also there is a sense out there that there has to be a new approach in the state legislature, not just for your district, but in general, that people are kind of tired of the same old politics? Yeah, I think that is what has been said within the community. Uh, people want action-oriented and solution-oriented leaders, and I believe that is something I bring to the table, and that is why I believe the Waianae Coast community has showed up and got out their vote to uh, get me the nomination for the Democratic Party. Yeah, Mark Pa'aluhi, what, what do you think uh, is the sense of the public out there now about the way the politics has been operating? I, I, I agree. It's, you know, change is definitely in the air. Um, the community is asking for a fresh new approach. And I think with what we have now on both sides, from the Democratic side as well as the Republican side, we, we can offer that. So, you know, it is like you said, everybody's kind of tired of the same old politics. And yeah, it's something that, you know, our approach is offering for, for our community. How would you describe your approach personally? Uh, you as a person, you as a politician, it's different from the way things have been. Well, first of all, I don't like to think of myself as a politician, but more as a statesman. And I think what I bring to the table is, you know, my blue collar background. Um, it's definitely not something that you see very often with me coming as a, you know, construction worker from the, the ground up. I mean, from labor, labor to carpenter apprentice to uh, super, superintendent now and safety person. I think with that experience kind of, that, that approach will be more hands-on, definitely boots on ground. And that's how we're running our campaign is very, you know, grassroots and uh, from the community, for the community. And Cedric, you know, your community has a lot of needs. Um, how do you prioritize? I mean, you, you, what do you think is the most important issue that your, your constituents will want addressed? Yeah. The most important issue on the YNI coast right now is our transportation and public infrastructure. We have suffered from countless hours of traffic. I personally have worked in town for over three years and spent an average of four hours a day just traveling to work that I'm not paid for. And I think that's the same uh, sentiments that are being shared from the community. And as the next state representative of YNI, that will be my top priority is to address our transportation issues. And I think there are a few things we can do right now uh, to address the issues we are facing. Um, some of those solutions include uh, creating easements for buses to pull off Farrington Highway. That's one big thing. Uh, syn synchronizing our traffic lights. Uh, that's another big step to progress. And then also we can uh, focus on creating the turning lanes that not only hit from Nanakuli Avenue and Haleakala, but hit from uh, Sack and Save area and down to 7-Eleven in uh, Nanakuli. I think those would be very uh, big steps in the right direction for our community. Mark Holly, what do you see as the most important? Let, let's start with the transportation issue. Okay. What do you see as the solution there? Well, I think there's no one solution to fix everything. But I think right now we're taking a step in the right direction with this new contra flow. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to be out there from day one and work with Mr. Ed Sniffin of DOT. And um, we actually went and we assisted with the compiling of information. We were able to count cars for him the first day. We also went and traveled eastbound because, as you know, we, I think we hit the mark as far as contra flowing the traffic coming in. We took a lot of the volume off of Farrington, but the byproduct of that is our eastbound traffic we now have, which, you know, we'll get it right eventually. But again, this is just a band-aid solution for now until we actually do our road expansion to get that fifth lane. And then also, you know, like, like Cedric had said, with the, the dedicated turn-in bus lanes, I mean, that's going to, when those buses stop on Farrington, they take away one whole lane of traffic and during peak travel hour that that actually causes a major bottleneck which of course backs up our traffic you know how do you how do you guys look at your the ability to get money projects to the coast i mean i've spoken to a lot of people out there over the years and there's often a sense 
of, among residents that there's sort of an economic discrimination going on, that this is a district with more poorer people, with younger people, um, only a couple of representatives, one council person. That, do you feel like that's something you have to overcome? I do believe our community has been neglected as far as uh, public infrastructure improvements, um, and that is something that I feel is very important for our community to move forward from. And as far as being a state representative, my key is not only relying on the state to help fund these transportation projects, but also working with our congressional delegation, as well as our city and county of Honolulu to bring forth those solutions and implement those solutions with the funding that will be provided as a collective. Let me ask you, um, Mark, you know, when you look at the daunting prospect of going and being one representative and even being a Republican representative in the state house. How do you, what do you see, do you, do you, how do you rally your community to get them interested in maybe even believing that there's a political way to get some help? I mean, how do you, is that something that has to happen to get people engaged? I believe so, and I think just bringing it back home to our side of the island, I mean, we have the perfect example with Representative Tupola in District 43. Um, she's, again, boots on ground, just like me. And uh, she's been able to rally up the community, you know, sometimes when, like, like was discussed, we get neglected from, you know, our funding and a lot of the, the laws that should be helping us to, and policies that would be helping us to our benefit on our side of the island. But she just goes, you know, f right into the community and rallies up the troops and gets them out there from cleanups to, you know, rallying for road safety, as well as, you know, pushing through this, uh, well, with the help of our other elected officials, well, pushing through for our, our contra flow project. So you know, I think it is effective. You also brought up a, a, an important question because not only are the roads congested over there, but they're dangerous. I mean, you folks have a lot of fatalities yes. over there. I think you had more than half the pedestrian fatalities yeah. are happening on that coast. What, what kind of things do you think are needed to make things safer there, too? Oh, most definitely is, you know, getting our lighting out there addressed. I mean, the, some of our crosswalks out there, we have some infamous crosswalks where we had pedestrian, multiple pedestrian fatalities and accidents. And I think lighting up those crosswalks uh, sufficiently is a, is a good beginning, as well as, you know, we had talked about on the neighborhood board is putting the flashers in our crosswalks. We've seen them in other, um, other neighborhoods, and we kind of feel shortchanged that they wouldn't offer that out on our side just yet. Uh, Cedric, your thoughts about the safety issue? Well, the safety issue of our pedestrians have been uh, one of my number one concerns as well. That has actually, that was actually the reason I joined the neighborhood board back in 2014 was because of the fact that I see, I'm an active member of my community. See, I walk, I bike, I do s sort of things like that. And I've seen how dangerous it is to, to uh, use our roads for pedestrians. And so some of those improvements, again, what uh, Mark said was street lighting improvements. I believe that we need to restrip our bike lanes and our crosswalks. Uh, I think they're- Do you even have bike turn, lanes out there? Yeah, we do, but they, <laughs> it, it's not really, it's, a, it's not a bike lane. It's a pretty scary lane to ride on. Um, and then so for great. our unsignalized crosswalks, I, I believe flashing cross lights is, is a big thing. And then creation of sidewalks and, and, and walking paths it's for our It's just having community. sidewalks, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's simple it, things yes. like you that. You think that uh, that should be in every community, but it's not. And I also believe that uh, pedestrian drivers education platforms are important for our community so our pedestrians and our keikis know what to do. Um, education, you know, the schools out there, and this is a really directly a state issue, the schools out there are among the lowest performing schools, highest poverty level, a number of challenges to those schools. Um, Mark Paul, Louis, what, what do you think uh, is happening there that they would be low performing and what do you think the solution should be? I think a lot of it has to do with policy and, you know, just trying to fit everybody into one box is not the right approach. I mean, for every demographic, there's going to be the right type of uh, education. You know, for every student, for that matter, there's the right kind of education. You can't squeeze every student into the same box. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking into a lot of land-based education opportunities. You know, we like what, like, the Navigation Society is doing and, you know, uh, even our charter schools, our, our um, Hawaiian charter schools, that's, this is all things that are, you know, again, cultural based, yet they're able to translate the curriculum into something that's more um, palatable for some of the students, yeah. 
Um, Cedric, a specific question from a viewer. How can you retain more teachers in the schools there? That's a huge issue, right? That is. And I've actually worked at Makaha Elementary School, and I sat on Waianae High School's advisory board as well as Makaha Elementary's advisory board. So I ha have dug into a lot of the issues that we face, and teacher retention is probably one of the biggest things. One of the biggest things is that our teachers are not being paid enough. Um, that's one of the issues I've uh, discovered while working there. And then the other thing is our transportation, and that's why I think it's the number one issue. Because right now with the contraflow lane uh, and, and people having to take two hours of their day to get out of YNI now. Uh, we are looking at losing more teachers because they're not getting paid for that. They have other obligations to meet and they don't, they're not incentivized to stay here. So we need to address our transportation issue and that also goes into uh, our health care as well, to keeping our, our doctors here. That's been an issue for, for our community. So um, I think those are two of the biggest issues dealing with teacher retention. You have any thought on the teacher retention issue and, and particularly the funding of schools. You know, as a Republican, I, you know, I, we make assumptions about what your philosophy is on money, but do you feel like uh, there could be more money put into our school system? I believe it should trickle down definitely. To my understanding, the DOE receives probably the largest budget from the state. And it's just a shame that our poor teachers don't get a good chunk of that money. I mean, we, I mean, we're getting what we pay for, really. Um, my wife is actually going to school to be a teacher, and you know, we've been through the show. She actually taught preschool for the military before, and yeah, it's it's really not you know a high-paying job to look at in the end. But you know, it's it's like teachers like my wife that have a passion to want to raise up new young leaders. I think that's what's going to make the difference. But also lobbying to you know help out our, our, our teachers to retain them, you know, again, offering retention. And like Cedric said, yeah, the, right now, for, for now, bringing it back home to the um, contraflow issue is, you know, that outbound traffic in the afternoon, it is, it, it's a stigma for now. But, you know, we're, I'm sure they're going to get it right eventually. So we just got to keep giving keep input. Yeah, we keep staying actively um, commenting back with well, them. You know, one of the reasons that the traffic problem is so bad is, most people have to leave the coast to get to their jobs, yeah. right? And so this question from a viewer, what can you do to help raise up the local economy? How would higher incomes, better jobs benefit the community? Uh, Cedric, what, what do you think, I mean, are, do you support more economic activity out there, even if it meant, you know, you might have more people coming to the coast? I know there's always an issue about too much development on a coast like that. Yeah, exactly. And I believe there needs to be a balance. I do believe there needs to be uh, opportunity for economic growth in YNI uh, because of the fact that we don't have livable paying wage jobs out there as we need to. Um, one way I would diversify our economy is focusing on agriculture. I think that uh, YNI is one of those communities that can produce a large amount of, of food for our community and produce that sustainability. And I think the farmers out there need to be supported and also re uh, redeveloping the current establishments that are out there uh, is a good key to uh, creating a thriving economy. What, what kind of jobs do you see supporting out there? Um, I, this, I believe because we are the breadbasket of this island on the leeward side, you know, um, of course agriculture, we, we need to make it a lot easier for our farmers out there and our fishermen for that matter. You know, we have um, vast resources out there that for some reason or another just kind of going, you know, overlooked as far as it, as being an economic um, drive. I'm curious, uh, you know, what kind of role would the state play in, for, for example, building up the fishing industry out there? Um, I think what our current um, representative has initiated already with the improvements to our boat harbor, that's a huge step in the right direction. I mean, we, from what I've seen from her and my vision for the harbor, we're kind of on the same page as far as, you know, um, looking at that as a source of, um, economy an economy booster basically you know we have there's already businesses that are run out of um, Waianae Harbor but I could it's not even close to its full potential okay so I've got about only two minutes so I'm okay. gonna ask questions quick and hope we get some quick answers so really quickly uh, Cedric we do need to ask this question I mean are you solid with the party yeah 
So I, I attended the Unity breakfast. And and just just to, for, by way of background, there was some question about whether you were qualified because you'd been another party in a prior race, right? Yeah. So um, I have dealt with that situation right now. Uh, we're moving on to the general. And I attended the Unity breakfast after the elections on Saturday was uh, accepted with open arms by Democratic Party members, elected officials, as well as uh, the party state chair. So I feel that uh, we're, we need to move away from the party politics and move on to, to winning this general and, and getting to the issues and presenting solutions to solve the issues that the YNI Coast community faces. Okay, Mark, uh, 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 Louis, the last question is along the same lines. The per person asked, why did you affiliate with your particular party? Republican party, wh why choose that party when there's so few Republicans? It makes for an uphill battle in the legislature. Uh, my value system aligns closer with the party's value system. I'm for small business, you know. I'm for, uh, I'm for um, our more conservative values. Uh, you know, being a family man, um, I do have a very, I'd say, conservative um, approach to things. But not necessarily saying no to everything. Um, I also feel that you know, what's the sense in having three Democratic uh, okay. candidates? I have, to, right? I have to stop now. Thank you both, gentlemen, very much. Good Thank luck you. in your race. Thank you. Mahalo to all of you for being with us tonight. Coming up on Insights next week on PBS Hawaii, we'll talk with the candidates running for State Senate District 9. That includes Hawaii, Kai, and Anahaina, and has been held for decades by Senator Sam Sloan. The only Republican now serving in the State Senate. Is this the year for an upset by his Democratic opponent, former City Councilman Stanley Chang? We'll also hear from the candidates vying for the vacant seat in House District 29, which includes Chinatown, Kalihi, and Ivalay. Thank you for watching Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff from Hawaii News Now. Ahui ho.